Hello and welcome to today's live stream. Do me a huge favor and let me know where you're joining from. Hello and welcome to today's live stream. Do me a huge favor and let me know where you're joining from.
just like that, we are ready to kick off another Lunch and Learn. And I want to point out nobody's in store, so that's why I don't have my mask. But if someone does come in, I will be popping that Pixel mask on to keep everybody nice, safe, and sound. So I am so excited about today's presenter. I've gotten the chance to uh, be in person for some of his classes, as well as you know just see him shoot and see him share with the community. And to say, I would say prolific isn't even you know, a uh, accurate word, just the amount of air, you know, just this, the amount of planes that this man has shot both air to air in cabin air shows, the stories that he's told about flight has been just such an inspiration. I love, I love flying. I love flights. I love planes. I love all aspects of it. So I'm so excited for today's presenter. So let's go ahead and get our friends on right now from Sigma, unmute some mics. How are we doing today, guys? How are we doing? Doing great in Oshkosh. Excellent. And Mr. Mr. Brian, how are we doing, sir? I am doing well, thanks. Uh, greetings from the northwest suburbs of Chicago. Excellent, excellent. Little, little bit of rain over there, I hear. Oh, gosh, yes. Yeah, we've had like eight inches of rain since Friday night. It's a little crazy. It's a little wet. Excellent. <laughs> So I'm, re I'm ready for summer. I'm ready for no rain. I'm ready for, it sounds like a lot of air shows are actually being canceled as of right now, right, Jim? A lot of them are. Um, Oshkosh, which is probably the biggest one in the country, has been canceled. Um, and I know going into at least August, I think, um, you know, hoping that maybe, uh, the, in fact, I did see there's a little ultralight convention that's going to happen in September. Uh, so there may be some small ones if people want to shoot aviation, small ones in, you know, whatever state they're living in. Um, you know, there may still be some people out there doing some flying and having some get togethers. Absolutely. And it doesn't hurt to get a little bit of knowledge and be ready for that. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I do want to say hello to just a few people that are joining us. So hello, Alan from Cuyahoga Falls. I see a photo uh, a really cool aviation photo of a f like a plane flying above and then looks like a kid. Really, really cool photo there. Hello, John. Hope you are doing well from Cleveland, Ohio. And then Mark Force from Oshkosh. So it looks like we have a couple people joining us, about 12 or 13 people so far. Let's go ahead and get right into it. Jim, tell me, what are we going to be talking about today? What are some of the main points? Well, as I recall from a few years ago um, in a marketing meeting, it was brought up that air shows across the country are second only to NASCAR when it comes to uh, spectator or as a spectator sport. And there are probably a lot more air shows than there are NASCAR races. So it's something that in, I think every state that you live in, you can go to an air show. So um, you get to see planes in the ground, planes in the air, you know, a lot of cool exhibits. So it's something everybody can partake in, and it's a great photo opportunity to attend one of these. Excellent, excellent. And before we jump into it, I wanted to uh, just reach out to Brian, and he wants to share a couple of things that Sigma's doing. Uh, first and foremost, thank you, Sigma, for you know helping us put this together. Uh, we appreciate it. And then there's a couple other things that you were doing as far as giving back as well, right? Yes, uh, just uh, several things. Um, Sigma is donating to uh, the Cleveland Food Bank for, we're donating 5% of Sigma sales from Pixel Connection to the Cleveland Food Bank. And in addition, um, we've got some other things going on to uh, obviously, you know, people are at home. So I know that uh, Pixel's running a weekly photo contest as is Sigma. Sigma's running a weekly contest that you can go check out at www.sigmaphoto.com. Uh, there's some very nice weekly prizes and uh, as is uh, prizes from Pixel. So uh, please, by all means, check those out. And it's, it's a great, great time to stay inspired. That's the biggest thing, you know, with Sigma. Yeah. That's a very, that's a pretty big prize. I think it's like 500 bucks that you can win for photo and video. And we're that doing a $50 gift card. So I definitely urge you to check both of those out. And then I have some slides at the end um, with some more reminders there. So Sigma, yes. again, thank you, Brian. Thank you, Sigma, for putting this together. Jim, let's go ahead and get your presentation started. We'll get it up on screen and we'll get started. All right, let me, the one thing I want to start off with is yeah. um, it's a pleasure to work with Pixel Connection again. 
and I was in Cleveland last year for um, your one of your shows. And there is an Oshkosh tie into Cleveland because Steve Whitman, who um, they named the airfield after in Oshkosh, he was an early aviation pioneer in Wisconsin, used to race at the Cleveland Air Show back in the 30s. So uh, we have that little tie-in going on I love right it. now. I love so, it. It's like a, like a sister city almost. That's true. <laughs> so are we good? Have you got a slide? We are good to go. Okay. So what I want to talk about is, um, you know, the, the way people have access to aviation, to airplanes, to watching them fly, um, the air shows around the country are one of the most common things you can attend um, to see this. So what I found shooting, especially shooting for magazines, is we're not just after an air show plane that has white smoke behind it uh, or a screaming jet we're after the whole flavor of the event then and it it's opened my eyes to all the things that are available available to you so this is going to take us through some of the options and uh, the things that are available to you that you can take advantage of so one of the first things you see is just all the people in all the airplanes and you know it, it's it's impressive um and it's a good way if you want to do crowd shots to show your friends how you know how big this event is and how big the airplanes are compared to people. So one thing that I always do at an air show is go around and try to, to make pictures that show the airplanes together with people around them and especially the crowd size if it's really big. Now, in addition to that, I like to zoom in. I love telephoto lenses. You'll see that there's a couple that I use uh, throughout these pictures almost exclusively. And in this case, it's the 100 to 400 contemporary Sigma lens. And it's really small, really light. It works on full frame. While I'm shooting, I'm uh, shooting Sony. And when I was shooting Nikon, it will do the same thing. It'll work on full frame and crop sensor cameras. So I like to get the crowd shot, but I like to zoom in. I like seeing all the angles and the colors and and uh, but i like to have that human element in it so this is a picture from oshkosh from a few years ago of two people that were checking out a jet on the ramp and um, you know looking closer is always something that i like to do now as you walk around when you get out of the main areas they have planes usually segregated by antique and vintage and home built and warbirds and ultralights. And it's fun to walk around and see the different types of airplanes and the settings that they're in. And this is one just to show you uh, two different ways of shooting a subject. Uh, it's really easy to shoot from eye level on the ground. And I'm using the 100 to 400 on this one. And it's a nice picture. I tried to frame it nice with the tree up in the top and people talking. And with the hanger in the background, you know, it's a nice picture, but you can also take a really wide lens. And I've started using this technique of putting it on a monopod and putting it on timer and holding it up in the air. You know, it can be six feet, eight feet, something like that. And trying for a different shot that puts the plane a little bit more in the foreground. Uh, the advantage of a wide angle lens is that it'll do that. You can can accentuate your subject in the foreground. In this case, it's the 14 to 24, and it doesn't take too long. I, um, like I said, I put it on timer, and you keep the camera as steady as you can and as squared away as you can. And usually, you may be crooked on the first shot, but by the second or third, you've kind of nailed the composition you want. Now, air show is um, probably the highlight of a lot of uh, what air show is to people, um, the noise, the smoke, all the action. And what I found, especially this last year, is I could pretty much cover an air show with one lens. And for me, that's the Sigma 60 to 600. Uh, you know, you can just about cover everything from 60 millimeters to 600. And the thing is, the lens is really sharp. I mean, really sharp. 
So this has been my go-to lens. You will see as we go through some other pictures what I was using in the past, but this lens just about does it all for me unless I need a really, really wide zoom. This is, um, you'll note as we go through, if you can see the, the metadata below the picture, this is at 1 400th of a second. I generally try to not go faster than that or it'll freeze the propeller and make it look like the engine shut off and it's gonna crash. Um, you can start coming down and I probably uh, may have one in here at 1 25th of a second. Uh, the slower you go, the nicer your picture is going to look with that blurred propeller, but your percentages also drop because there's a lot of movement going on and you're using a slower shutter speed. So I'd like to, when I'm shooting airplanes in an air show, I'd like to start out at say four, one four hundredth of a second, take some pictures and then start moving my shutter speed down until I'm almost to the point when I look on the back of the camera where I'm not getting them in focus. They're just not sharp. And, and then I'll move back up a little bit. Now, I was talking about, I use the 60 to 600 a lot. My other go-to lens is the 150 to 600 contemporary lens. Uh, very sharp. I've used this for years until the 60 to 600 came out. This, this lens is light. It's very economically priced. Uh, I'm looking at my metadata here and the plane before was at 1 400th of a second. I'm down to 1 1 60th of a second in this one. And you can see that the if you look in really close that the props have got quite a bit of blur to them. I'm using, I've, I've used Canon, Nikon, and Sony through my career. I'm pretty much on Sony right now. Uh, I'm finding mirrorless works really good for me. But, um, you know, really I think it's it's what you're comfortable with. Canon's got some good cameras out there. Nikon's got some good cameras out there. So it's what fits into your budget and what works for you. Now, we were shooting propeller planes, and I was at 1 400th, and, you know, we want to keep it below that a little bit. Jets are really cool to shoot, but they come by really fast, and because there's no propeller, it gives you great leeway to crank that shutter speed up. In this case, I'm at 1 200th of a second. There are times you need to up your ISO a little bit to get a shutter speed that high. And one of the cool things about shooting jets is when they come by, especially if the air's got some humidity to it, you start getting this vapor building off the wings. And from an aviation photographer standpoint, I would say seeing the vapor coming off the wings and seeing the the exhaust, the color of it, uh, you know, those are kind of the key elements you really want to get in a picture. I also want to point out that if you are along the flight line shooting this, even with one of our 150 to 600 lenses, you may have to go in and crop in Photoshop or whatever program you're using for post-production. You're not always going to get as tight as this. This had a little bit of cropping to it. Um, the other thing is because it's moving so fast, and actually this applies to any airshow plane that's flying, is you're panning. And it's the same technique that you're using if you're panning something real slow and you want to blur the background. In this case, you really don't notice the background is blurring, but you're still using that panning motion to keep the plane in, in as much focus as you can. A question that I have, a couple questions actually. So yes. um, are you, a question that came in, are you on a monopod or a tripod when you're shooting? And then, you know, you have the 150 to 600 on here, but you're shooting Sony. So can you tell us a little bit about the um, MC11 and all that fun? Very, very good on both of those. Um, yes, I'm using the MC11 adapter uh, for Canon mount lenses, Canon mount Sigma lenses. And you know, I know I've been to uh, a lot of shows with Sigma and people always come up and they're worried about the adapter. And I got to tell you from a professional standpoint, and I've got to deliver to magazines and newspapers, I don't have a problem with that adapter. I think everything works perfectly. Uh, to me, it isn't slowing any focus down. Obviously, it's not affecting sharpness because there's no glass in it. All it's doing is adapting the lens to 
um, the mount and the focal distance to the mirrorless camera. So, um, you know, I think if you have to use an adapter, don't worry about it. Um, I think it works perfectly. And what was the other question? Um, are you on a tripod or a monopod when you're shooting? You know, I'm not. For some reason, I have always been a hand holder. Uh, when I shoot sports, I am always hand holding. I've tried tripods or uh, tried monopods. And what happens is it works for a while. And then, you know, if a plane goes overhead, you tend to want to raise the camera to get it in. And I'm whapping somebody with the tripod or with the monopod. So I find it too restrictive for the kind of shooting I do. Although I am thinking uh, of using a gimbal head for for certain shots. I'm just thinking that with a long lens, it may have some advantage. So it could be that the next air show I go to, I may try a gimbal head. It's just that a big tripod and a gimbal head is a lot to carry in. You know, if you have to walk a couple miles from the parking lot into the air show or your spot, uh, you have to carry it around all the time. So that's the downside of that. But, um, and there are some shots we're gonna show later that you do need a tripod. So it's, you know, it's something I wouldn't rule out. It's just mostly for my style. It just doesn't work. Excellent. Let's go off to one more jet. And interesting about this is I usually tell people, and I have gone to Oshkosh because I live here, number one, and I worked for EAA for 28 years, is Airshow Center is where everybody seems to want to be. And because of that, it gets packed with people and, and it's difficult to get up front and, and get some of the shots that you want. A lot of times I find if I move down one side of Airshow Center or the other, that I get better shots because the planes are coming down and turning around near you or uh, they're doing other maneuvers that actually put them a little closer visually than maybe Airshow Center would. And this is a really good example of this because we were leaving the Airshow and at this time didn't know this was coming by. And we were in the parking lot. It was a, a parking lot that was fairly close by, but we had put a lot of our gear away and we were just sitting down taking a little breather. And all of a sudden we see the B2 coming by and this is with the 150 to 600. And after they do their pass with the crowds, then they angle off a little bit to start another turn. So they were actually angling toward us and they were you know, closer than, than it would have been had I been down on the air show line. So sometimes you, especially if you're at an air show for more than a day, you kind of watch what happens, kind of see where the airplanes go during their act. And you can find locations that are better than being in the center of it all. All right, air show is maybe the most exciting thing. Uh, I know for a lot of people it is. For me, I like all of it. Um, you know, I love the action of the air show and talking to my friends in between acts and, and all of that. But people, uh, as well as the airplanes, can be a really important part of it. And if you don't have some of the long lenses, if you don't get a good location, then you're going to find people and pilots just about anywhere. And it's a great place to do portraits and, and capture that feeling of aviation. This is my friend Luke, who had just taxied in. Uh, and he was all excited. It was his first air show that he had flown into, or first Oshkosh he had flown into. And I went up using the 100 to 400 and just nailed that smile that he had. Uh, he was excited to, you know, to be there, that he had actually flown in himself. So again, you'll notice I tend to like longer lenses. Unless I'm going to do something really wide, uh, the 100 to 400, um, the 150 to 600 is a great carry around lens, as is the 60 to 600. Here's a picture of a pilot friend of mine, and I was trying some different angles for portraits. And this is shooting past the engine with him in the cockpit and using the 60 to 600. And it's real easy to just move your focus point over. And uh, I can keep him in focus. I can blur out the foreground, although you can see that it's an engine by the, the fins. And I thought it made a, a nice portrait with the leather jacket and a helmet and, um, 
and it was just uh, one of the better ones in the series that I shot. Here's another one of a friend of mine. And one thing that, that you'll find at air shows, especially if you're trying to shoot people, is a lot of this takes place at high noon or it's, you know, 11 o'clock to three or four, but the sun is pretty high. And in this case, my friend Sarah wanted a picture and luckily she's in a Piper Cub and that's a high wing airplane. So the wing itself is, is creating shadow so that I don't have harsh sunlight on her. And a little thing that we also did on this is as she was sitting there getting ready to pose, there was a little bit of, of harsh sunlight coming across her cheek. So we just had the owner of the airplane pick up the tail and move it a little bit until the, the harsh highlight was off and she was in total shadow. So uh, sometimes you wait for the right time of day. Sometimes in this case, and with the owner's permission, we moved the airplane a little bit so I could get this, this shadow-free portrait of her with the 105. And pointing out, you were talking about the MC-11. This is the Sony version, uh, the E-mount on the 105. One really cool thing about, I think, most of the major air shows and, and maybe some of the smaller ones is they'll have reenactors dressed up mostly as World War II, and, and they may do some other ones. And it's, it's kind of cool to just hang out there and watch history, living history, right in front of you, uh, because these reenactors are really serious about how accurate they want to be and what they're wearing and what they're talking about and um, in the portrayal that they're making. So it's really cool to take pictures of them with World War II airplanes in the background. In this case, this is one from Oshkosh. And you can get some interesting pictures. There are also great pictures that you can sepia tone or just go into black and white and really give it that feel from back in the 40s. Now, you know, I'm saying action takes place during, you know, high noon, the, the main part of the day. But there's a lot of really good pictures that can be taken as the sun is going down later in the afternoon, the, the light's getting better, you know, it's the golden hour. And one thing that I do in a lot of things is, is instead of um, having the sun on, even low light, having it on the subject is I'll try to backlight it a little bit or just let the light kiss off of it a little bit and, and just see what it does. And especially with airplanes, with metallic airplanes that, um, you know, the sun follows the pattern of the metal and the bends, and you can see clouds in this one uh, picking up the colors. So you can can get some really artistic photos, I think, uh, just zooming in close on an airplane with just a section of it. It doesn't have to be the entire airplane. I think photographers are probably more than, an, than just an aviation enthusiast. They may want to see the whole airplane, but I think photographers... Uh, like the idea of going in a little bit more and finding out uh, what's creative to them and what little piece they can photograph to uh, express their art. Now this is one at sunset and uh, you know, it makes a nice picture, but one thing that I found at air shows, especially when there's a lot of clutter in the background is lay down on the ground. You know, I've got some nice light on the airplane with the sun going down, but that low angle, especially with biplanes, can be real interesting sometimes. And and this is a case where, uh, you know, there were planes and people just on the other side of the little hill that this is on that you could see if I was standing up. So by laying down, uh, not only can we see the airplane better, but I'm eliminating people and airplanes and clutter in the background. Now, this is, um, this is something you can do with any camera is shooting at sunset like this. You can also uh, put your flash on your camera. And I know there are people that paint with a flashlight. You can do that a little bit later. Um, and that's an interesting technique to use, too. And it's very simple to do. You just need a tripod, put your camera on, um, and you have to play with it a little bit. Uh, it's an art. 
and you flash the or move the flashlight across the airplane very quickly and and see what you get and then you make changes as you go until you get a nice looking picture you can also put flash on in this case i've got three um you don't have to do that you could actually do this with one flash in the camera i'm getting a little backlight from the other side of the engine uh, which i think added some separation um, just watch the glare there's a lot of different surfaces angled surfaces on an airplane so it'll kick glare coming back at you. But what I found is um, if you're getting, if you, you've got the airplane at the angle you want, you're getting some glare, it could be something you can just take out in post-production. So go for what you think is the best picture and hopefully you can fix that a little bit later. Now, you know, we're talking about airplanes and, and shooting them full, full uh, width and moving in tighter for things. But I also find that just moving in really tight on details, uh, cockpits are really interesting to me, especially older airplanes because they don't have a lot of instrumentation. Um, you know, they're, they're historical and you can get some pretty cool pictures from it. In fact, I did a whole series once, a photo show on just airplane cockpits and it turned out to be really interesting when you see all the instrumentation as it changes through the years. And in this case, I've just, um, interesting tip that I use on this is I did use a little flash. I've got the Sigma 24 to 105 on, but what I found is, and number one is you always ask permission to shoot in an airplane. So I had the pilot's permission on this and he helped me up the wing. Uh, so I wasn't gonna scratch anything. But you turn the camera upside down so the flash is pointed down so that it fills in under the black panel and you're seeing the the wood, the wood is lit up. If I had the flash on top of the, or the camera, the right side flash on top, it would have come down and cast a huge shadow down there. So it's just something that you can play with here and there. And um, it takes a little bit of, it's sort of like putting the camera on a monopod and, and uh, shooting that way. Uh, unless you can really see the screen on the back to line up everything centered. Uh, it takes a few pictures, but you can get a nice one, um, you know, after two or three tries. Yep. And I did have a question that did come in from someone, um, and you brought it up, you know, with getting permission. Uh, but Kyle Davidson wants to know, Jim, do you have any suggestions for how to get to know local pirates, I'm sorry, pilots pirates. at smaller airports? I've reached out to several local groups and most seem a bit apprehensive to letting others photograph them. I think some of it depends on what type of photography you want to do. Uh, and we'll get into it at the end of this. Air-to-air -air photography is probably the ultimate for an aviation photographer. And people may be, pilots may be apprehensive of that if they don't know you or know your skill level or know who the photo pilots are. If it's just... Um, you want to shoot some cool airplanes in the ground or if they're taking off, if it's a smaller field. Um, I think it's just keep asking or check on Facebook, keep conversations going with people. I've had pretty good luck going to small airports and, you know, just hanging around talking, telling them what I want to do or what I'm looking for. Can they help me? Um, you know, I do that, especially if I want to light a plane up at night. Uh, can you position the airplane for me? And, then I'll get the lights out. I'll tell them what I want. I'll give them pictures of it for free for helping me out. Um, but I think more than anything, communication so that they know what you're after and, um, and that you're going to be safe about it. Excellent. And then for a lot of these, I mean, does it require, um, I know that you've worked, you know, in the, with the press in the past and still do, you know, does a lot of this require a press pass for you to get this, you know, the location that you're at or like inside the cockpit and stuff like that? Or is it more just you asking? I think it's more just asking. Um, and this is more of a personal observation through the years, but uh, a lot of times I don't even wear my credentials. If I'm at Oshkosh or someplace, I just want to be, uh, I don't want to push the press thing. But in a lot of ways, it, it isn't that much of an advantage. There are some places where your press pass will get you into a little, uh, fenced in area or, or roped in area where you have a little better access during the air show. 
But in a lot of cases, it isn't really doing anything except allowing you to go to a press conference or, uh, you know, store your stuff in a press building or something like that. For the pictures that I want for magazines and things like that, I don't use a press. Well, I mean, I've got one, but I don't really use it or show it. Uh, I generally try to strike up a conversation with somebody, uh, let them know what I want to do, that I'm interested in their airplane or, you know, in them and, and how this would make a great picture and, um, and pretty much do that. You know, I think communication is the biggest thing. Excellent. Thank you. And we're talking about inside cockpits. You know, this one is kind of flat. I like it because it's an antique plane. This is inside a DC-3. And, um, you know, this is one where I wanted to really try something different. This was for a magazine story. And after I shot what I needed for the magazine, then I thought I was going to be a little more creative. So I like the way the, um, the throttles and and the controls looked and the colors and the ball shaped on it. So this is with um, the Sigma 24. And with some of this, uh, looking at the metadata, I'm at F2.5, but it's kind of fun when you shoot something like this, just to bracket through with your F-stop, you know, try it at 1.4, try it at 2.5, you know, interesting to see what happens at F4, F5, 6. Obviously you're going to bring in more of the panel in the background into focus and at what you know some of this i think is um it's your eye and your art and what really appeals to you and one person may like it all in focus and somebody might like it totally blurred out so i think it's a chance to um do what you want to do and and sometimes like when i do this i don't even know uh yeah i know at f 2.5 i'm going to blur the the panel out a little bit but is that as much as I want? So I'll bracket through a lot of this stuff and look at it. And then when I'm going through the edit process, then I can compare everything and go, you know, I like it just a little bit more here, a little bit less there. And um, so if there's a bottom line to that, it's shoot a lot of pictures. You know, it's a lot of work to go through when you get done, but it gives you so many options. Uh, you know, even looking on the, the LCD screen on the back of your camera, doesn't always let you see the full picture. Um, no pun intended because it's a small screen, but uh, I have to see things on the laptop or on the iMac so that I can really see the relationship. So shoot a lot, try to vary settings. You know, if you're shooting sunset, it's great to vary uh, shutter speed so that you can be lighter or darker. You never know what actually may appeal to you on the big screen. In this case, with depth of field, you know, the same thing bracket that so that you have an option to pick something that really appeals to you. Now, one thing, and I we just jumped into this with fireworks. Uh, one thing that a lot of air shows are doing these days is they're doing a night air show and they're doing fireworks afterwards. And I just realized I did not put in a picture of one of the night air show acts and some of that is oversight on my part, and some of that, don't laugh when I say this, but I kind of suck at shooting night air shows. Uh, I could do better than I do in the day. You know, it's it's difficult to do, but I really love shooting the fireworks, and I've um, you kind of figure out, back in the old days, there was a little card that would tell you um, your camera settings when you had film, and I could never understand. They'd give me the setting for shooting fireworks, and I couldn't understand it. But I've come to realize that the basic settings are going to be pretty much the same for everything. They're only going to vary a little bit. And you look on the back of your camera and you vary it as needed. Then, So this is at Oshkosh with the, the Sigma 12 to 24. When it first came out, I got a chance to shoot it. And you'll notice I'm at F11. So I kind of stay F11 somewhere between F8 and F16, but, um, you know, in this case, I picked F11. ISO is 100 to 200. In this case, I'm at 100. And I find four to six seconds. So somewhere between those three settings, I can get really good fireworks pictures. And the longer you let the shutter speed go, obviously, you have to compensate on your f-stop uh, a little bit. 
But the longer you go, the more those little bursts are going to, um, you know, stream out and fall. And you can go too far. Again, it's personal taste and, and your own style in this. But it's it's kind of fun to play with it because, you know, you make the changes and you vary what that looks like. You know, this is one last year from Oshkosh. I was shooting the new Sigma 28. Again, you can see the settings are pretty much the same, F11, six seconds. I did do, um, this one has one little thing, if you look, if you can see it on your screens, is I also did, uh, I wanted to I wanted to see the people in the foreground. They'll tend to silhouette out because the fireworks are so bright. So in this case, there's a longer exposure in the foreground and you can see people blurring a little bit. Uh, it may have been like 20 seconds. And then it was a little composite where you just erase out uh, the silhouetted people so you can see people in the foreground. And, you know, talking sunset and whatever, again, people, you know, I like to put people in my shots. Just for me, an airplane just sitting there is not that great, but uh, not, I don't want that to sound wrong, but uh, I love people in it. I love pilots. You know, this was a young pilot and his friend walking out at sunset uh, to go flying. And, you know, I, I'll get these pictures in my mind. And, and so I had to move the plane up so that the sun was going to go down behind it. And, um, you know, the nice thing using the 60 to 600 on this one, I could shoot it wider. I could shoot it tighter. It gave me a lot of options for focal length. And I shot an awful lot of pictures on this just to get, uh, you know, I'm looking for their steps so that, you know, one foot's up in the air a little bit. Uh, you know, the more you shoot, the more you realize how many don't look as good as the ones that do look good. So, so that's sort of my take on, on air shows and what you can do on the ground, shooting on the ground and shooting up in the air. We are going to go to, here's a couple of options that you can do as you get a little more intermediate with some of your skills is using a remote camera, which means you're going to mount it on one of the struts on an airplane. This works out better with a high wing in this case, because it has struts. Um, people do this with GoPros all the time, but I like to do it with a bigger camera because I get better results. And in this case, I was using the new Sigma FP camera with the 14 to 24. Uh, you'll notice if you can see in the picture, I've got a Bogan super clamp uh, and there's tie wraps all over that, holding the camera to the bracket, uh, to the camera bracket, to the other bracket, the uh, there are tie wraps holding it to the strut because the last thing I want to do is have something fall off and hurt somebody. So have the pilot check it over when I'm done, make sure everything is really sturdy. And that if, <clears throat> excuse me, if anything breaks off, uh, it's not going to fall and hurt somebody on the ground or damage the airplane. This is one from Oshkosh last year. Uh, again, camera mounted on the strut. And what I do is just put these on intervalometer. I'm, I keep wanting to say the old days. Well, in the old days, we used to string hardwire and have the pilot press a button. And the wires were always in the way of the picture when we shot film. And it was up to the pilot when to press the button, really. And I found with intervalometers that you'd put it on every two seconds and it just keeps shooting. And you get some really interesting pictures. So that's one way you can get some different aviation pictures. It's probably best to do this at a small airfield and get used to what you're doing and make sure everything's safe before you try it at a fly-in. Um, here's the simple one in cockpit. And I went for a, a barnstorming ride with this pilot in a small airfield down in Southern Wisconsin. And the plane held five people and I was sitting in front of them and I just leaned back and snapped a few pictures. And, uh, and this is one of my favorites in doing that style. Uh, this is one where I was sitting in front of my friend Jessica and I'm trying to see, I'm thinking I'm turning sideways on that. I think I tried shooting this over the top of my head and it didn't work as well as twisting around in the seat. This is one in the back. 
and this was a lot easier to shoot. I just made sure I had the pilot looking sideways to me every once in a while so I could see her face. And this was one um, from this, this winter uh, down in Florida. We had done a shoot in the Florida Keys and we were coming back and I just loved the glow of the, the gauges in the cockpit and it's the city lights of Miami in the background. So when you're in an airplane flying as a passenger, you have a lot of options on what you can do for fun and, and good pictures. Now, what a lot of people consider the ultimate uh, in aviation photography is air to air. And that means you're in one airplane and you're shooting another. So it looks like this. These are pictures that uh, were taken back when I worked at EAA. And the plane in the foreground is the photo plane and has a door that comes off. And we have a long safety briefing with the other pilots. So everybody is in communication and is safe. That's the main thing about one of these. And I have a headset on. I talk to my pilot. You can see the baggage door has been taken off. Uh, and we had uh, you know, FAA approval to do that. There's a lot of little hoops you have to go through to do this correctly and legally and safely. And here are some of the pictures that you can get. And this is talking shutter speed, uh, the, the, the prime shutter speed for shooting air to air is a 60th of a second because it's gonna make that prop do a full circle like that. And shooting earlier in the morning or later in the afternoon, the sun's gonna be lower so it lights up that prop and gives you that nice little glow like that. Here's real quick, really kind of, um, uh, before you go to that one, real quick, I have a quick question. Um, or, um, no, you don't have to. Just in okay. air to air in general, you had mentioned, you know, to take that door off, you had to get approval um, to do these flights. Like, can you just talk a little bit about some of the things that you have to get approval for, or you know, what some of the considerations that you have to make before even attempting a project like this? Well, I'll give you the best. Uh, the best answer is I have a, I consider the best photo pilot in the country, but I've worked with him for 30 some years and I leave it up to him. He is the expert. He actually uh, is a FAA designated uh, examiner now, but with the airplanes that we use, um, he knows what's legal, what, uh, if, he, if this, the plane allows the door to come off and or I shouldn't say in flight, but can you take it off and then fly with the baggage door off? So there are rules with the airplane itself and then the FAA has to be okay with that. Um, so I, I leave all that up to him. Uh, obviously if you're in, um, I showed a picture of my friend Jessica and the Piper Cub. It's a very small airplane and, and the door folds down. That's one where it isn't an issue at all really. Um, you know, but the biggest issue I mentioned before about we have a safety briefing and these will usually last an hour. Sometimes we go over the frequency we're going to talk on. We are always talking, always communication. And it's always me to my photo pilot, to the subject. So, um, my pilot's always the one in command of everything. And, and we go over, um, you know, really stressing safety. We go over where we're going to fly or kind of the general direction we're going to go in because we want to put the sun to our advantage. Uh, we'll talk about altitudes. Uh, we'll start out maybe 1,500 feet or 2,000. And if it gets bumpy, we'll go higher. Some of the stuff you kind of um, decide on the fly, um, you know, depending on the conditions, if it's bumpy, if there's really cool clouds, 10 miles to the west of you, hey, let's go over there. So we're on the radio doing all that, uh, making changes from a creative standpoint. But the safety issues are always uh, a priority that we're not going to get too close, that uh, if someone has a problem, if we're trying to do something they don't like, we're not going to do it. Uh, and I think the biggest thing, you know, I mentioned I've been with my pilot for over 30 years, is if someone wants to do these, there's an organization called the International Society of Aviation Photographers. Um, they're on the, on the, you can Google that and they can help you uh, find someone to mentor you. It's not something that I would recommend that if you want to do this, you just go to the local airport 
and say, I want to hire a pilot and I'm going to go shoot my friend. It helps to, uh, you know, talk to people that have done it. It would help to have someone mentor you first and go through it so that you understand the safety aspects. Uh, and the creative aspects are, they can be difficult too at times, but um, the safety thing is really the biggest. Excellent. All right, this picture, I don't have metadata on these, but um, this is with the Sigma 60 to 600 last fall. And I could not believe that with the stable, and I'm only using stabilization in the lens that this came out as sharp as it did. The stabilization lens is just incredibly sharp. Um, and this was at a 60th of a second. So, um, you know, the airplane is not as close as it looks because I'm using that longer telephoto. I think I may have been at about 300 millimeters. Um, the plane is behind us at a safe distance, but the lens is really letting me zoom in. Uh, and I cropped this a little bit too. So that's that feeling that it's just coming right down on you. Interesting thing about this picture, this is a warbird. And uh, what I was out to do with this was show what I could do with the Sigma 18 to 300 lens. And not that, uh, you know, generally I'll use a 70 to 200. 70 to 200 Sigma Sport is just fantastic lens for all my air to air work. That's what I probably do 80% of it with. But I wanted to show what can you do with consumer lens and incredibly sharp, very versatile because you can go from 18 to 300. Uh, you know, it's great zoom range. And it's something that everybody could afford. So this, uh, again, sorry, there's no metadata on this, but this is with the 18 to 300 contemporary lens. You know, I love shooting because we're up early or late doing these, um, you know, some sunset silhouettes are always nice. This is over down by Key West. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like the final shot on a mission that we had down there. The, you know, I'm saying I love the 70 to 200 sport. Before that one came out, I was using the 100 to 400 for a lot of work because it was super sharp, light, and I had that extra little distance if I needed that extra little focal length if I needed it. And this is one of my favorite pictures, again, with the 100 to 400. Uh, we're turning out over the Atlantic Ocean by Miami with these two planes I was shooting for the company. And, uh, you know, the nice thing about shooting in the air is that there are clouds and they change the shapes, the colors, uh, you know, they really make the picture with an interesting background. So it's um, it's one of the nice things when you're flying is you, you see so much change from on the ground, the background there, or if you're above the clouds. So real quick question, and I don't, I don't know if what you said in a previous slide um, ties into this as far as exposure is concerned, but on that last shot, like what are you, what are you focusing on when, what are you metering on? Because obviously there's a ton of dynamic range in that scene where you have the sun in there, but you still have details in the clouds, but those, you know, those planes are not falling into darkness. So like, what are you, you know, what are you metering on? I generally use, um... I'm trying to think Nikon uses matrix metering and I know Canon calls it evaluative and I'm not sure what Sony does, but I generally use that for metering. Uh, in this case, I may have opened up exposure compensation just a little bit on it. And then in post, I opened up the shadows. You know, there are a lot of things I'll tend in post-production to open up the shadows just a little bit. So, Wait a minute. Obviously, with the sun back there, they would have been pretty silhouetted. Although, you know, one nice thing with this, too, when you're shooting, um, this doesn't happen on the ground, really, but when you're shooting airplanes above clouds, those clouds are big reflectors. They're big white cards, and they're pumping light to the underside of the airplane. And sometimes even in a case like this, uh, depending on if there's a buildup behind us, it's going to kick some on to the dark side, too. So it's some really interesting effects you can get sometimes on, on what light and clouds do.
and I think for my last one, I started doing, um, I saw this going around on Instagram for a while, is taking your color pictures and just going black and white. And uh, you play with the contrast, you play with the clarity, and you almost get like a chrome finish to it. And uh, so this was one of my examples of that, that you don't have to uh, stay in, in color with everything, that you can play with things a little bit. And, uh, and I think this really pops in black and white compared to the color one. And that ends my presentation. And uh, Absolutely. So my I'm social just... media contacts are down below. And I thank you very much for having me for this. Absolutely. There were so many good tips that were in there about, I mean, just the different storytelling aspects and even just providing like that air to air, you know, just some inspiration on that. So again, thank you so much for joining us. And I did want to pause just for a second to see if anybody has any questions, any questions at all. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start sharing my screen here because I have a few announcements. But get your questions in, guys. I mean, how often do you get someone that has such a dynamic portfolio of so many awesome, you know, flight, I mean, plane photos, just stories to tell. So I want to make sure that you do get your questions in. Uh, it does look like there was a question that came in, and I think you answered it by all your example images. But do you like shooting with a Sigma 60 to 600? I do. And... Um... You did mention do I use a monopod or whatever, and and just to expand upon that, it's you know shooting sports. People will ask me, you know, I'll see comments on an Instagram post, and it's like, how how do you carry that, or or you know it's so heavy, and you know I'm not trying to be special about it, but I just I'm one that doesn't shoot with a monopod really, and I I will hand carry that sixty to six hundred an entire football game or you know a soccer match. Uh, there are times I'll set it down if I have to, you know, I'm going to check on the phone or something, but uh, I just, I hang on to it. And, uh, you know, maybe that's, it takes the place of the gym. I'm not sure, but, uh, you know, we all develop styles and mine is just, uh, I'm going to hang on to this and, and shoot, I keep my shutter speed high and it works out fine. Excellent. Uh, Karna had mentioned, hello, Karna, by the way, uh, the color on the throttle really pops. So just a little bit of feedback there. Love that. A question that came in, any base settings for cockpit, sh cockpit shots at night? Uh, I'm wondering if Guy means when they have all the new avionics that light up, um, you know, and the, we are so, uh, we've got it pretty easy these days when we can just shoot with a digital camera and look on the back of the screen. So that is the easiest thing, you know, does it work? But I would would say, you know, shooting at sunset or some of these, the avionics these days are so bright, you can shoot them in the sunlight. Uh, obviously not sunlight falling on them, but uh, you know, if it's, um, you know, the, the panel is in, in shadow, they're gonna be bright enough. You could shoot them at four or five o'clock. It's not gonna be an issue. Otherwise, shoot them at sunset or just before sunset, and you'll have a little bit of ambient light in the sky, and I think that looks a little better uh, with everything lit up. Excellent. Uh, another question that came in, is there a rule of thumb for prop blur? What is your philosophy about the blur? And I think you touched on it a few times, um, but what is your kind of go-to setting for um, the blur on the propeller? All right. For the blur, if you're shooting air to air, it just seems like a 60th in the 60th to an 80th. It all depends on the RPM that the prop is running in the plane, but they all pretty much a 60th to an 80th is going to be good. What I try to do, especially if it's a little bumpy, is I try to do insurance shots at one to 50th of a second. And this is air to air, so it's going to have a little twist to the prop, but uh, it isn't going to freeze it. And at one to 50th, I'm going to have a lot more in focus because I've got that faster shutter speed. I, the bumps aren't gonna matter that much. So it's 125 or 60th in the air. Uh, I don't like, if we compromise on that and do 125, it's kind of weird, I should have an example of this, but it tends to give you like a little bow tie of the blur. And uh, it just strikes me as not natural. So that's why I go to 250 for my insurance shutter speed, a 60th for the ones that I really wanna look good. And it just seems like 
most you know the the prep blur especially for air to air um that's just a standard that's what we all do now because it really makes it look like the airplane's flying if you're shooting air show uh one four hundredth to begin with was that something i said <laughs> but very nice mask no a customer just walked in so i want to make okay. sure we're safe not a problem just teasing you uh for air show one four hundredth of a second will still give you a little bit of blur and you're going to have a lot more in focus because of that faster shutter speed. Just pan with the action. I know people that can shoot a 60th and they'll get a full blur on an air show plane. It's something I can't do. Um, so, you know, some of us have gifts with steady hands and good eyes. Uh, I try to limit, you know, 125 is maybe as slow as I'm going to go. Um, but I, it's something you play with, uh, just like panning, a bicycle going by or a race car or something like that it takes practice. Absolutely. Another question that came in um, from Kyle, would you recommend networking at local air shows? Also, I shoot Fuji and have the 55 to 140. Do you know of a recommended adapter for Sigma to Fuji? Uh, the adapter one, I don't, I personally don't know. Um, I, I thought I heard that Photodiax had one, but I'm not sure how it would perform. Um, you know, I mentioned the International Society of Aviation Photographers. It's a good organization to get into, or if you're going, you know, you could contact them through their website. If you're going to an air show and say, you got any members in the area that I could talk to, uh, they would be really good people to, um, you know, give you some, some background and information on where you can go and what you can do, tips on shooting, things like that. Uh, if you're really into aviation photography, it's you could consider joining the organization, um, and you know you can get a lot more than out of some of the seminars they have and and things like that. Talking to people that do this all the time. Excellent. Another question that came in. Um, thank you for the great information. I've tried to I've tried to I've tried air to air years ago with film. Very difficult. Also, if you mount a camera on an aircraft, be aware of weight and balance. The pilot should know this. Absolutely. Yes. Kyle, and I worry too about the, the drag on a strut, you know, if it's too big of a, GoPros don't seem to be that much of an issue. Uh, mirrorless camera is gonna be a little bit more, but yes, make sure the, the pilot's aware and, and okay with everything. Absolutely. Kyle, uh, T, is the Pixel Connection possibly going to have a group shoot related to aviation photography other than the yearly Cleveland Air Show? Um, that is definitely something we could take a look at, especially it seems like there's a lot of interest. I mean, everybody stayed through the entire presentation. Uh, this is definitely something I'll look at as far as putting together a group here locally. And I'm actually going to reach to that ISAP and find out kind of the local photographers that are in that and see if we can't get you know, a little meetup group or, a, you know, maybe bring Jim out to do some of the, you know, some hands-on instruction stuff. So yes, Kyle, that is something I will definitely work on. I love the few times, oh, I'm sorry. I really enjoyed your presentation. I love the few times I get to shoot planes. So some, some good feedback for you. So thank you again, Jim. I really, really appreciate it. So I'm going to jump into, and again, if you have more questions that come in, please feel free to put them out there. I'll do one more check of questions before we are done. But I did want to let you know of some housekeeping notes. Uh, we are still open at the store here to serve you. Our hours are 10 to 7 Monday through Friday and 10 to 5 on Saturday. And we are offering curbside pickup and free shipping um, and or free shipping. But the store is open. We just ask that you, you know, wear a mask when you come in. If you have any questions or suggestions regarding our live streams, we do this every day at noon. So feel free to send those my way so that way I can make sure I am you know, educating you and finding presenters to do so. If you do come into the store, I wanted to let you know that you know we are disinfecting everything. Uh, we are wiping down equipment surfaces all the time. Uh, we have hand sanitizer here for you to use. Um, as you notice, like I put on the mask because a customer walked in. Uh, so again, we're making sure that we're wearing um, masks at all times. Uh, the only reason I didn't during the beginning was because it's kind of difficult to uh, to talk and uh, have a mask on. Uh, we are making sure that everybody stays back six feet. We have some stuff on the floor to make sure that, you know, you know how far that distance is. I want to let you know that we also put out another episode of the Talking Pixels podcast. So that is live. Uh, you can go over to social.thepixelconnection.com to download the latest episode. 
So Pixel Photo Fest is right around the corner, less than 90 days away. And the plan is still to push forward with this. Again, you know, we're monitoring the COVID situation day by day. And as things change, we will be sure to let you know. We already have a great lineup of speakers. So our first 10 speakers have been announced. Uh, so again, top in their field. And they are here to educate you on three days of hands-on instruction. And actually, you can use the code Lunch and Learn to save $100 off your admission. So that's normally $200. It's actually cut in half for you guys. So just use code Lunch and Learn to save $100. I want to let you know about our weekly photo contest. This week's theme is long exposures. So you can see here we have those kind of long exposures. That's actually the Panasonic headquarters there uh, that I photographed from a hotel room. Uh, and I just let my shutter speed go. And, you know, I got that nice long exposure. I want to see your long exposures. You have one entry per person, and it doesn't have to be something that you go out and shoot today. It can be something that you have shot in the past. It's a great way to win a $50 gift card. I want to let you know that Tether Tools is still doing their 10% off until the end of the month. That was a great talk that we had a couple weeks ago with Tether Tools about why Tether. Uh, and they're offering that until the end of the month. As a thank you for joining today, you can actually save $25 off any regular price Sigma lens, $399 or less, or an additional $50 off any regularly priced uh, $400 or more. So again, you can just reach out to us for that uh, through the website. Everything is live on the website but you can always just shoot us a message on social or give us a call at the store. I wanted to let you know that we are also working with Sigma to raise money for our local food banks. That's the Cleveland Food Bank. And 5% of your Sigma purchase goes directly to the Cleveland Food Bank and families in need. If you need some additional help, we are also offering virtual one-on-ones where we sit down with you uh, for an hour and actually just talk about whatever it is you need help with. These are designed to be one-on-one -on -one and kind of answer any questions that you might have. I want to let you know what's going on the rest of the week. Tomorrow, we're going to be talking about adventure elopement, which is a very interesting topic. And again, it is sponsored by Sigma. It is going to be really, really good. It's something that I know absolutely nothing about. Uh, so I'm interested to learn a little bit more about how to be a elopement photographer. I think that would be a lot of fun. I've done one semi elopement uh, where it was just me and the couple on a lake and the, the person that actually married them. It was just, you know, the four of us there. So again, I'm really excited about that one. And then on Thursday, we have Joel Grimes to come in. And he is, if you don't know Joel, he's a great and inspirational photographer and just a great guy. So again, tons of information will be shared there to kind of get you kicked into high gear coming up to you know, the out of pandemic season. And then finally on Friday, we're going to talk about the Friday Focus, which is our kind of weekly show where we talk about the news and all the juicy rumors that are out there. So another question actually did come in. So let me go ahead and get rid of that uh, thing there. Um, what is, oh, I'm sorry. So ask Jim to explain why AirVenture is different than most air shows. Well, AirVenture is probably the biggest in the country, if not the world. It has, um, I'm trying to think of the last year, it was 14,000 airplanes attended and parked and camped. Uh, goes on for a week. Uh, I can't think of all the numbers. The numbers are phenomenal of the air show acts, the airplanes on the ground to look at, the seminars and workshops that they have. Um, this is uh, where everybody comes in the country to get together the last week of July, um, except for this year. but. Uh, to talk aviation, and uh, it's just, you know, one of the best places to be at. And you can find a little bit more information. Again, it was Air Venture. Uh, do a quick Google search. Should be airventure.org. Airventure.org. There we go. Airventure.org, and you can find more information about that. Um, also, is there, can you talk, touch a little bit on like some air show etiquette or things that you've kind of gone when someone does at an air show? Like, what are some things that attendees should be cautious of or like what's the etiquette around air shows? You know, I think one of the biggest things is don't touch the airplanes. Uh, it's, it's a thing that I've, I mean, Oshkosh has had the problem and sun and fun in Florida and, and, uh, sorry, something's beeping here. Um, <laughs> is, you know, there are people that will lean on an airplane, they'll rest their soft drink on the wing of an airplane, they'll let kids 
touch, you know, all over. Some of these are fabric airplanes. Um, then you can put your finger through if you push hard enough. So um, it's really don't touch the airplanes. Don't put anything on them. Don't go in a cockpit without asking. Uh, always ask permission. Always show respect. Uh, you know, don't smoke. I, I think there's no smoking at most air shows, but uh, especially on the flight line, the airplanes all have gas in them. You don't want to be smoking around there. Uh, you know, those are the biggest, I'd like to say common sense, although uh, <laughs> every year someone is is doing that and they're not thinking. So uh, let's say common sense and, and <laughs> my common sense. Absolutely. Well, that is all we have, guys. Again, remember that practice makes perfect. And if you have any questions or need anything from us, please let us know. You can email us, sales at thepixelconnection.com. Reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or if you just want to give us a call, we are here for you guys. Again, Jim, thank you so much. Sigma, thank you so much. We appreciate everything uh, that you, you know, all the information that you shared. And if you guys need anything, please let us know. Thank, thank you guys you. very much and have a good day.